Hi guys and welcome to the Alpha Entrepreneurship 2.0 podcast. And this week which happens to be the first podcast that we've recorded and we've recorded it with Suyash and Anisha of Dot and Key who happened to be one of the first members of the Alpha network and I had a fantastic uh, you know conversation with them about uh, what family business brings to the table uh, you know what legacy issues did they face how do they go and turn around uh, their business so it's a very interesting conversation and uh, with the series you know we plan on kind of recording more podcasts with more of our members who've you know taken their own businesses to the next level and uh, i hope uh, you know with the alpha network podcast we can talk more about entrepreneurship uh, what business means how it affects us both in our personal and private lives and in our professional lives and what we learn from all that we do on a you know daily basis so i hope you really enjoyed the podcast and uh, you know follow it so you know we have uh, you know suyash and anisha and a remarkable story especially with alpha and uh, why i say with alpha is because suyash is one of the first members of alpha so it's important to kind of talk about that but uh, as you know you know thanks for coming guys and talking about what family businesses are and uh, you know i've kind of tried to coin this on this podcast is entrepreneurship 2.0 for the simple reason that we are 2.0 in our family businesses right because we come from all of us mostly all alpha members uh, you know come from a family business where they're mostly second generation or even now third generation business people and mostly you know i've now been in the business for 15 years and i've seen that uh, business really has a legacy issue you know we all come from our own backgrounds uh, we kind of the uh, you know carry the sins of our father right <laughs> and uh, the whole idea is that there's a lot of advantages to being there from family business and i i possibly feel a lot of disadvantages also but you guys have one of that story that where you've kind of been in the family business uh run it for some time and then at the same time kind of you know tread your own path make it on your own do something um uh, remarkable and has had a lot of impact so uh, anisha we'll start with you right you please talk tell us about your whole background in uh, what you did where you studied and then what is the family business in Robert Clark sure so um i did my i mean i, I was a complete science nerd right in school and uh, pre- pretty much top of my class wanted to obviously take up science because that's a natural course that you're supposed to take right when you're a topper in school kind of a thing i think not bragging here but it's just how that happened and i do i wouldn't have it any other way because of my background in chemistry it was very easy for me to get into my father's business which was beauty and personal care and uh, however that was not planned when i obviously started considering what to do in my graduation and post grad uh, which is why i went out studied in the uk for a year did my masters in food technology and uh, came back to join my father I was with him food technology the, yeah. yeah you went from I mean, chemistry to food technology <laughs> but that was also natural right <laughs> Chemistry is obviously a vast. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's kind of different to like the family background in terms of absolutely. But at least the whole plan was that you'd come back and start something in the food space. It but, was actually, and that's still the plan. Okay, that's my post retirement plan. I'm not going to interrupt you. So <laughs> no, that's post retirement plan. I'm definitely mm-hmm. using that bit of education. Um, and so you should join me in that. Yeah. Discuss <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, came back, uh, joined my father. I worked actively with him. safe to say i think four four and a half years um because of no business background it was difficult to get into the hardcore uh, management aspects of the business right away so i started with product development getting into formulations of what went behind the product the cream face washes etc you know absolutely work with the product which is very important in fmcg and uh, with that i also started learning a little bit about marketing and branding um natural course after you get married cannot work you know typically my wife said it cannot work or should not work in a father's business so break away start something of your own fortunately i had that support from my indoor side of the family ki ha theek hai kuch karna to hai so you can obviously do something but do it away from you know the typical family background i was like okay theek hai it's an opportunity for me also for a living opportunity which is why talking he was born in the first place right to put all my learnings from my father's business into something that i could call my own and to do something constructive also in life i didn't want to sit at home be a homemaker i didn't see myself like that nothing wrong in being that but i just didn't find complete uh, you know solace in that so turnkey was born i think one and a half years into our marriage and so yeah obviously was involved since the very inception as a support a background support because most of his time back then went into the real estate business 
right? So Sugam was primarily what he was looking at, but nonetheless, the aspect of digital marketing was something that I didn't know, which he was always doing when he was selling flats. So I let him take forward his journey and how you know he contributed to the birth of Dot and Key and henceforth. But yeah, that's primarily how it was launched. In so where where did you do your uh, uh, post school education? I was in UK for a year. I was in uh, Leeds University. So you did your masters there. Yeah. But undergrad you did here. Undergrad was in Calcutta and Xavier's hardcore BSc chemistry. <laughs> so yeah. So you were you were at Owen Kadhisan School, na? Yeah. Three years my junior in school. Oh, I didn't know that. You didn't know that? No. Okay, so yeah. So so yes, please. You know, uh, we went to the same school. Uh, you, you're, you're again, like I said, second generation construction business at home. And uh, where did it all start? I think um, back back in the day from school, you know, I was a pretty average student, science, rank thirties in class, you know, nowhere nowhere close to the brightest kid in class, and yet pretty bright kids in class. But uh, you know, in class nine, ten, somehow I just started coming first in accounts, and. Um, I loved economics. I just loved how the business worked and how you could put uh, studies to real life, and that really excited me. And boom, like that thirty something ranker started coming in top five in class and started ranking in class. So I think uh, personally, my professional life or what I would be the shape uh, started from then. You know, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and that's when I really found myself. I applied abroad just because my family had a legacy of of sending the kids uh, applying abroad. Uh, I went to Indiana, uh, America, four-year course, uh, real estate finance and entrepreneurship uh, in my undergrad. Learned how to live alone. Um, you know, just as cocooned as uh, as a younger child, cocooned uh, with my parents, just like super protected. I never really found myself very well. I think uh, when when I went to America, that's where I really found myself. Uh, made my own choices. And that four years there of real grilling, um, exceptional courses, smart people, um, and great uh, education, which at least I feel uh, really shaped who I was as a person. Uh, real estate again, I chose real estate. Just, just sorry because, to interrupt you, but what did you study in the US? Uh, so I studied real, real estate uh, finance and so entrepreneurship. closer to what would be used back home. Yeah, and entrepreneurship. Hmm. And you know, when I was in America, I wouldn't really spend a lot of money, you know, on myself. Because I never found it uh, justified for some reason. I just always felt that I want to really make my own money. Right now, I'm still kind of borrowing from my dad. Uh, so uh, you know that that thought was always there, uh, really engraved in my head. Uh, and and I always thought I'll have my own business, and when I have that, I'll do what I really want to do: really spend the money, um, really go out and do things which I really want with my own personal accomplishments and anything else. You know, so that seeding had started back in America. When I was there, right? That, and and doing that entrepreneurship course from one of the best colleges for entrepreneurship in America. I think that uh, that entire framework for uh, starting a new business, I think, started cheating then. Um, is what I feel. I came back, joined the family business of real estate, uh, worked for a year. Uh, then, uh, just because you need a master's degree, and you know, as a kid I was, I obviously wanted to experience London for a year. So I went to Casden School, London, for a year. Uh, studied there, met some brilliant people, really sharp minds. From good colleges in India as well, had had a, a fabulous one year. Came back, you know, with a renewed energy, renewed vision of what I wanted to be and who I was as a person. That one year completely transformed me into uh, uh, something that I am today. Honestly, as a person, how I look at things very very differently from America, uh, more city, sharper people, and ready to take on the world. I think once I got back, the obvious stance for was to join the family business, right? It's low hanging fruit. You don't really have don't really have to work too much towards it. Uh, you just gonna get get something, uh, get it easily. You know, you gonna get a job practically. But once you come back to your family business, you realize the work is like hundred x what you do otherwise because you have a very very large shoe to fill. Uh, you have so much to learn, and that that intense sense of uh, uh, accomplishment which had to be. Bought in from the work that I was doing, I think uh, that started keeping up after a couple of years at Sugam. So, you know, that's how uh, the entire uh, entrepreneurship drive on actually taking up projects, executing projects, and really understand how business really works. I think that's how I really got the experience in about four five years um, into into Sugam. Uh, and then of course uh, I met Anisha, and then you know uh, we got married. Uh, she wanted to do something interesting, and I'm the entrepreneur in me always like you know was awake. 
or dormant, but had to wait some time, right? And and that's when uh, uh, I think dot and key was born because I always thought whatever we do, we got to do it big. We got to make sure we do it structured, and it got it got to uh, make a time uh, count, right? Because just doing a business on the side uh, does not really make sense. Uh, it has to be solid. It has to be impactful. And that was the thought from from day one. So I, I'll come to Dot and Key in a bit yeah. now. But <clears throat> so tell me something. So as you know, second generation entrepreneur, and, and you know this is a question first I ask you in the uh, in the social answer. Is uh, we all come from a certain amount of privilege, right? Um, <coughs> where uh, e- educating ourselves, uh, you know, abroad in India, these have been options that are always on the table, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I, a lot of people don't get access to that. So uh, you know the the choice that we had uh, personally when I did not enter the UK uh, is uh, that you know that that option is always on the table. So now having that option, do you think that when you had like you did your masters in the UK, do you think it added some kind of uh, exposure to your uh, you know your perspective on life and around it uh, because. At the end of the day, you know, uh, and again, like you said, coming from privilege, it's not like it was your first exposure abroad. Uh, you probably would have had a lot of holidays abroad. So it wasn't like that, you know, shocking experience, which a lot of people kind of encounter, right? It's their first yeah. time abroad and gone there to study. Oh, so, well, so yeah, yeah. so we, yeah. we didn't have that, right? So we kind of fit right in when we go there. Yeah. So in terms of your perspective on life, education, etc., how much do you think really impacted was, or whatever you carry today in your working style or your thought process, is impacted by that one year abroad? So I'll actually say a little bit before that one year, which was undergrad in Xavier's and in chemistry, okay. So it was very difficult. Why I say difficult is because the course was grueling. It was science. I didn't know science the way I knew in my undergrad, right? It made me learn how to work hard, harder than I ever worked before when I was in school. And that one year in UK honestly was a party because I wanted a break from everything. So yeah, as as uh, you know, learning or hard work wise, I think Xavier taught me much more than UK did. But UK gave me the confidence that I could actually live away from home and independently. And I figured out that I was much stronger than the credit I gave myself to be. So as in you know, I could I could do things that I didn't think I could be able to do. I was nearly twenty two years old when I went. So that is practically nothing, you know. Now when I go, I think the experiences and the learnings would be much, much more if I had to study away from home two years today, right? Well, so or maybe you, not you today, maybe even when I was 26, 28, right? But yeah. having been 22, when you're living away for one year, you have so much that you want to do. But I think it just made me realize that I was stronger. So uh, what you're saying is from an education perspective, might have not done wonders, yeah. but uh, from a confidence and self-learning perspective yeah, it was better for you absolutely. What about also life? about also about just making friends beyond school you know bonding with people beyond just people who you've known always in school because and the whole ask, idea of living on your own and uh, you know having your own house and your accommodation and yeah and going to meet those friends right which you normally don't absolutely, wouldn't do here absolutely, absolutely. so what about you Suresh? what do you think um in terms of the exposure yeah? because she did just her uh postgrad for a year yeah. you did four years of school in the us and then one year in the uk so you actually had two sides, Europe and the US. So, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, attribution to your learning process, your thought, uh, how you think, has it really impacted you than you think uh, more than you kind of realize? Or it's just like, it's okay, it's fine. If I've done college here or there, it wouldn't have made a difference. Well, I think uh, my four years in Indiana was a life transforming set of years because um, as I said, you know, uh, transforming from a boy, staying with the parents, to living alone and finding your likes, dislikes, uh, getting into the American schooling system, you know, which is which is, uh, which is is a grind, getting to one of the top B schools in the country, which is again not an easy task, and uh, really sustaining uh, good grades, finding what I'm enjoying, what I'm not, and really getting into discipline is something that the American education system taught me. Uh, you know, the Sunday library days, you know, Sunday was typically library day. In, in India, Sunday is a holiday, right? It's, it's a typical holiday, you don't really do homework also on Sunday. But uh, America taught you like, you know, Saturday or Sunday, when you got to get your work done, you got to get your work done. Having four exams on one day, you know, it's, it's it pushes you to the next level, making sure that you really, really, really uh, perfect things, you know, really plan in advance and make sure you meticulously approach uh, everything. So. 
all these uh, bits i think taught me how to stand on my own and make sure i can face the world alone uh, when required and really do it with a lot of discipline so i think that was my biggest learning you know apart from all the textual information you get it's the habits and the behaviors that you inculcate uh, that makes you powerful today i think that is something i got from america but it was a college town of 100000 people away from a city so it had its own separate culture going very different from a city so i really wanted to experience how city life would be uh, because honestly we all city dwellers and we like city life uh, went went to the uk had some great people studying with me great course uh, but what i really found was confident people and how do you make relationships with people to build your business right so i learned the habits of a successful person in america but how to tackle people and be confident and outgoing is what i learned in the uk you know so personality wise it helped me in the uk and um, you know overall uh, learning and behavioral wise how to kind of know how to win at least in our in my head was america so it is completely different worlds but i feel both was so important to make me who i am as a person and I, how i approach work um, and family in general so fantastic so <clears throat> now you know we've covered that so coming back so so yes when you kind of finished college you did your undergrad in the us you you finished your master in the uk and then you came back now that's 5 years of independence and then it's back to living at home and uh, i i always say the worst part about kind of working in the family business is that uh, you live with your boss so you know <laughs> so uh, you know what happens with people who work in the corporate world they can switch off so 7 pm they're done they go back home and you know the day starts again the next day uh, for us uh, dinner table conversations are uh, business driven breakfast conversations are business driven so all conversations are pretty much business driven so you know uh, that whole challenge when you came back going from complete independence it's 3 am 4 am you can go whenever you want come back whenever you want when you're back when you were in college and then you come back home and then you had to kind of uh, prove yourself uh, that you should be taken seriously in the workspace at the same time be able to add value so tell me what that was like i think uh, i think the biggest switch uh, between college and real life is uh you got to own things right in college uh, you had snippets and stints uh which which you could just finish and get done with it get over with it this is real life right so which you have to do year after year so i think the biggest struggle is the first 6 months where uh, you kind of uh want to do a lot but obviously not taken seriously because you honestly don't know much you feel you know the world but you don't really don't know much but i think coming back and really trying to fit into the business building yourself as a person making a place in the workplace which takes a couple of years a lot of patience and a lot of hard work i think uh, that has been my single uh, you know biggest struggle at work uh, you know in in sugam in general and uh, i feel i feel that the change was pretty serious uh, but it was really important because you feel uh, that you are responsible for things and you have to take owners of completing tasks and uh, entire uh, part of the organization and i think that learning was pretty solid so no but tell me this effectively right so uh, let's talk about the legacy issues that we spoke about so can you tell me two things that you think uh, were a good practice when you joined the business and that's something you want to take forward and and two things that you were like completely taken aback by like why has this not changed in the last 30 years is there something like that that comes to your mind uh i think i think two things which were which were solid learnings is uh you have to be very thorough in whatever you approach because uh you have to think of any um, action you take has has always has a long term repercussion so knowing that is very important second i think owning what you're doing uh because i realized that once you are an entrepreneur yourself even though it's your family business you have to really own the vertical and really drive it uh i think that aspect of driving it is something which i really learned and thought that you have to take it to the end you can't leave it midway there's no other option but uh if it's going good or bad you still have to complete it so that was my biggest learning which i've had from my family business i think uh, in terms of the basic habits that that i built i think two things which i wanted to change was how the teams were built like old school organizations have a style of building teams which might not be best for long term and uh, the way you think is uh, so set so molded that bringing what change is a challenge so i think uh, these two things which i wanted to improve were actually uh, incorporated in my future business did, did you face any resistance when you wanted to bring about change 
So the resistance is always there, but then uh, you know that once you want to bring out a change, which generally brings something positive on the table, um, it takes time. I think constant perseverance and like constantly when you at it, it happens. But obviously it takes a due, due course, due time. And it's always challenging getting your family's head around to something. Well, like my, my experience was I would type out one resignation letter a quarter. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> for the first three, four years, I was like, yeah, I'm done. You know, just <laughs> get out. Uh, I can't work for you anymore. <laughs> like no full circle. So yeah, uh, that was something that, that kind of encountered. But yeah, it's good to know that. You know, uh, you ha you kind of had solid learnings and you kind of built off that. And obviously, team building is, I believe, a big challenge, right? Because uh, we build teams because our generational thought, especially with our exposure, is that, uh, you know, you look at your teams as equals. And that whole concept of uh, owner, that, uh, you know, that Hindi Malik, Malik, Malik. Now, when you're building like second generation businesses, uh, you realize that there's no such thing. Right, uh, and it's it's time to understand that you're either an executive, you're a shareholder, uh, you're really not an owner. Uh, you know that kind of deep because we grew up looking at offices like that. Right, yeah. when your father went up the office, yeah. the staff would stand up, right, <laughs> and and now that doesn't happen. But it still happens to him. But like nobody stands up for me. But uh, uh, you know that kind of thing which has changed, and uh, I think that is a big reason because. Uh, a, a lot of the first generation people feel like you're, you're relinquishing a lot of control. Uh, you know, how can you entrust people with so much responsibility? Why are you not doing that? So, yeah. So, uh, Anisha, please tell me, what was what it like for you? So, when you came back uh, to the Storm Masters, came back, uh, joined Joy Cosmetics. That's yeah. a family business. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, what was it like then? So, honestly, I think for the first year, year and a half, it was purely learning. It was a very, very steep learning curve because I practically knew nothing about business. Like I said, I came for a, from a pure science background, pure academic. So what is your first role? See, I understand yeah. it's for us boys, it's easier. You just kind of fit in, right? Yeah. And, but it, I think your family uh, is a larger family than Suyash yes. in terms of the business setup. Yes, yes. So, you know, a lot so more team members. My uncle's son, who are oh. my first cousins, right? So they are involved in the business and one of them heads the larger aspect of sales and distribution, IT, HR. Um, uh, the other one heads uh, finance, accounting, etc. Right. So, and my father is primarily the product and marketing person, which is precisely why I was very mm -hmm. nicely placed under him, right. and I got that learning. Mm -hmm. But um, at that level, I started at the lab. I actually started making formulations myself under a chemist who was hired to teach me. So, like I said, the first one and a half years was purely educational and purely learning experience for me. I just started there. So it was it was not business. It, I wouldn't call it business because I did not know a thorough 360 degree about what was happening in the business. That slowly kept adding on over the next three years in life. You know how to look at business in a more uh, round, uh, you know, a, a more 360 degree approach to business. Um, how retail functions, for example, you know. So, um, so I'm going to stop you there for a minute. Okay. So uh, and and the reason I want to stop you there is you both come from family business backgrounds, right? But again, like we talk about legacy, the legacy that you both come from very different. Uh, one is hardcore construction projects, uh, you know, making buildings where everything needs to be in a different setup. Yeah. But you you were actually privileged in that manner where you came from a semi-corporate structure where yeah. you already had, uh, you know, kind of, I know families involved, yeah. but uh, since it's more FMCG space, yeah. the idea of teams, distributors, dealers, team leaders, somebody doing marketing, you already had that exposure. Uh, you know, in our case, I'm sure even in Suresh's case, the idea of building that out from scratch is more difficult. So, uh, would you say that because you were part of uh, that semi-corporate structure that you came back to, your journey towards uh, kind of working on building dot and key was far easier than it would have been to Suresh for Suresh to do it alone? Of course, uh, right? obviously, right? Because Firstly, the sectors are completely different, right? And obviously, the family structures were very different. So when I started after uh, marriage, when you know I started working from Sugam office to start working at Dot I realized how big a cultural shift it was for me to even sit there and function, right? Like to firstly, obviously, being a married woman and not being a daughter of the house, but to be a who of the house and then working from that office, right? That is itself a big change. But apart from that, the culture of the office, of course, was also more yes, boss here than there. Yeah. Um, in my father's organization, like you said, because the uh, amid management or even a senior management in some department did exist already, uh, people were contesting the thoughts of the senior management. No one would contest Papa's thought or his thought 
per se right they could only contest each other's thoughts bol diya ho gaya ha ha exactly so so this is the best possible i know to back there at a joy there was always fights happening not just within senior management but also the next in line so people were fighting against what they had you know as if because you were getting professionals hard core professionals coming from fmcg sure. uh, were coming in but uh, when i look at my journey at dot and key there's also a big difference and the challenge here for me and i was just telling suresh about this yesterday was uh, for me now when i look at dot and key i think it was very important for me to unlearn what i learned at joy because there were i mean the the business is beauty and personal care but that is hard for mass fmcg built from ground distribution up right and this is a premium beauty online b2c space very different and the space has only come up in yeah, the last the, 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 the whole sales channel is different right uh, it does not it like you don't have a distribution distributor as a dealer you know the marketing you don't have yeah so, i think everything huh? it's just primarily product that you can say overlaps but everything apart from that is very very different so it was very important for me and very challenging for me to actually unlearn whatever my learnings had been over four years and to understand what the challenges of this business you know were and how to learn the new ways of doing the same kind of business so it's not so, a cultural shift as such but it's more about unlearning so that brings me to the same repeat question right so yeah. two things that you think were good legacy things that you picked up added value to you when you were building dot and key and two things that you think you should have shared a long time ago uh you know in terms of uh, let's say value system or let's talk about things that were tough like you know uh i'll give you a personal example right the, i think 15 years uh, into business i have learned that uh, the the best way to move forward would have been to kind of actually hire a external financial head mm-hmm. and give control of the finances to someone where it's structured uh you know so things like that you know that's something i think i should have done the minute i got in like hire a cfo type of position to see okay you know so that we can focus on the growth and not worry about the money the biggest challenge is that uh, i think business all this faces and they because they want to control the purse uh, you know they feel like uh, okay money is the only thing they need to retain control so the yeah. voucher gets checked wo bas mara kitna laga wo samosa itna mehanga kyun tha that kind of deal right yeah. so that's my personal learning so in terms of that what do you think uh, you know in terms of what you carried with you but later realized that it wasn't worth carrying has there been such a thing so honestly the very example you gave is actually a structure that exists there for the last possibly 10 15 years now which hmm. is still not there in a sugam or even dot key right dot sure. key fairly new but of course you just say that these that are position. things that exist because the fact that there's a bigger uh, business, business uh, family involved uh, in the business it's not just a one person driving in a first first generation entrepreneur ke sath sath there bhaiyas also there are my cousins also which is the executive council right either but, way it but works but one of them actually dedicatedly is the cfo of the company i know i met him yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so so this this structure has been in the company and that is one of the things that we wish to obviously execute in both sugam as well as uh, dot and key wherever applicable wherever possible um and the other thing is i think it is so important to just challenge which was something that my father always encouraged ki हाँ नहीं बोलना है हर चीज में यू नो इफ यू हैव योर थॉट्स पुट इट ऑन द टेबल वी ट्राई टू इट बट लेट्स हैव अ हेल्दी डिस्कशन ऑन व्हाई यू थिंक दिस इज द वे फॉरवर्ड एट लीस्ट इन द डिपार्टमेंट्स एट की हैंड इट राइट सो दैट इज समथिंग दैट ऑब्वियसली वी इवन ट्राई टू ऑलवेज डू अ डॉट एंड के अगेन बिकॉज़ ऑफ द काइंड ऑफ रिसोर्स एंड द टीम दैट वी हैव एज़ वेल यू नो हैविंग दोस काइंड ऑफ थॉट्स क्लैरिटी दे आल्सो हैव प्रोफेशनल्स दैट वी हैव सो दैट इज टू थिंग्स दैट आई फील अम यू नो आई लर्नड व्हिच वर द राइट थिंग्स एंड आई वुड ऑब्वियसली वांट टू कॉपी दैट इन आवर बिजनेस अम I can only think of one thing which uh, could have possibly happened differently for me is I wish I had a more 360 degree experience from day one. Um, because I was a girl, I was protected. Yeah. I was put into a specific department only. But now when I look at my brother, who's just entered the business a year back, he's been given a solid profile. Again, one profile, but made responsible uh, to drive that that channel, right? So the ownership, the responsibilities. that he has currently a much larger he has more to lose or more to gain while for me like i said initial one and a half years was purely educational so there was nothing to really win or lose for me it was only my personal trajectory that was there to be formed at that point in time so that is something which i wish was there in my time also but i see the company already so, evolving so so let's explore that thought for a minute okay yeah. uh, i know this the idea of this podcast is not to go down in that line but think about the situation like you have a brother yeah. and you have a sister yeah uh, so obviously you know the 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 chart is cut out in terms of uh, who's going to represent your father yeah. uh, going forward in the business yeah. 
But do you think uh, it would have been, let's assume you didn't have a brother. Yeah. Do you think it would be a remote possibility that you would be kind of given your, this charge or your sister would have been given this kind of role or, or charge? Or do you think that the family business is still kind of uh, far away from that in terms of shy from that? That, uh, you know, uh, I have a daughter, but my daughter is uh, still, you know, at the end of the day, not going to enter the family business. She's going to get married and move on. And which is obviously changed in large fact, uh, you know, like, uh, and it's a very stupid example, but uh, Isham Bani holds a board seat on, I think, GEO or whatever, right? And yeah. uh, respectable being married to one of the other richest men of India. But uh, that whole idea of one board seat is there. Yeah. But do you think uh, that's still a challenge where we are in terms of uh, where the, the girl child will still be considered like, you know, even if she is the only child, yeah. we'll still try to figure out that her interest is protected. Where you know she will inherit the shareholding or the whatever yeah. it is, but I'm sorry, there's no room for you in the company yet. Do you think that still exists? I think it still exists for a large part uh, of the Indian business. Uh, you know, in some cases, I personally know of my friends. You know, or two sisters maybe, and one of them is very actively involved in business. At least so far, we're only thirty. We don't know hmm, sure. uh, what journey life will take, and when you have family of your own, how it's going to change, right? But um, I think that. It ha- there is a possibility of that changing in joy itself you know bhaiya's daughters are now expected to actually come into the business and run it because they need more people from the next generation taking oh, charge of the business that, that's a good entrepreneurs are always entrepreneurs professionals are always professionals i mean i'm not saying that you know if you don't have an entrepreneur no. next in line it's very difficult to survive that business but i mean and literally you know the, the family has skin in the game right yeah. so uh, from a senior management perspective no matter how much you compensate someone, you give me ESOPs also at the end of the day, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's still going to be a situation where if they get a better package or a better opportunity, uh, they're not going to think twice. Yeah. Uh, you know, that generally won't happen with a family member. But yeah, you have that, uh, you know, that whole setup of having a large family. So, uh, so tell me, Suresh, now, you know, I remember that this is, I think, way before you got married. You know, we were playing squash and we used to sit after and have a conversation on what's the next thing we can think of. You know, we're both kind of looking at things and I think your brother just got into the glass thing at that time. The glass toughening thing that is your other... No, 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 some friend. So some friend is involved, sorry. But at that time, because some friend was done, had done it, you guys are also thinking that you need to have a separate, you know, business revenue stream and you know, you and I were discussing like various things at the time. And it's around the same time that I kind of like started Aqua and, uh, you know, I think a year later, uh, you got married and I think... Uh, it's fantastic and obviously you've been in this space, but now tell me something. You re- literally kind of took that family business you were part of, you ran projects for some time, you, you did all of that. And then when was that moment where you thought, okay, now Dotton Key was something that you guys started together is fine, but I'm sure right at the beginning you wouldn't have been as active in it as you are today, right? Because you probably thought this is something Alicia started on the side and I can support her, part, make, give her the infrastructure in the office, etc. But did you really think from day one that uh, this was something that you are going to drive equally or uh, did it not start like that at all? I think, uh, I think the thought was who's going to drive wasn't in the head, right? Because when you start a business, you think about how do we make something solid, right? From, from the word go, we never thought of it as a small business. We always thought that we want to make something that needs to make an impact. So you went to the best uh, uh, content studios, you went to the best... Uh, uh, you know, brand creators in the country, you know, uh, and ask them to start working on Dot and Key with us, you know, that time project skill with us. And our vision of what we wanted to achieve was very clear from day one that we did want to build a fairly large organization, uh, primarily using young uh, talent, you know, in the city because the city actually lacked a lot of good opportunities for smart people. And build a organization with very strong culture and very strong personality using all the learnings you've had. And that vision was very clear with Anisha and me both there. So the vision was always ours. It was never Anisha's or mine. So we can't put a name to whose vision it was. Uh, but definitely like because Anisha knows a lot more about the business. Uh, she comes from the background. She knows how it works. She knows the product. Uh, plus initially the third party manufacturing was also being done by her family uh, for Dot and Key. Uh, it was it was her who was driving the business and I was more about uh, the business role of it, making sure the strategy was aligned, making sure the finances were planned, uh, making sure the sales were aligned, uh, but primarily driven by her. We never thought when I'm going to be completely here or completely there. 
uh, but it always was that the moment we feel the time is right and the business has matured to a stage where it can stand on its own and it has potential, I would switch. No, that was that was always the thought. That was a thought. That was always the thought. So um, it wasn't a, a thought in terms of that. This is also something I would do on the side. I, mean, uh, I have that issue, right? So uh, effectively, I understand you have a brother and all that. So yeah. in my case, in my family business, I'm the only one. So I always have that thing of where even if I like get into one thing too deeply, I know something will pull me back. So uh, I'm actually kind of having to kind of wear those many hats. But uh, you know, and it's not just about the payoff. It's also about uh, because you have that legacy, you want to maintain it. But uh, like I said, you know, in effectively in your case, what you've done is, uh, you know, there is a family business. It's still a solid business. It's not something that, you know, is on a downward trend or, or you know, is not doing as well as it's used to do. It's none of that, right? So you've actually kind of switched ships altogether uh, in terms of being involved full time in Sugam and then coming full time in Dawson Key. But uh, you, the question was that when you really started, uh, so you're saying from the very beginning, you had this thought that when it becomes big, I'm going to kind of switch over full time or did it start off with saying we'll see. And then when you realize the real potential of what it could be uh, is when you decided to kind of, you know, fuel that fire even more. To answer your question, it was the latter. It was not. Uh, it was not pre-decided. No, no, it was no. not pre-decided that he's going to switch. Ah, that's, that, that's what I was trying to get at, right? Because yeah, yeah, it wasn't. Honestly, um, the D2C space was booming. We saw a big opportunity right before COVID, right? Which is why we thought, let's try to make this even bigger than what it is. Hmm. And at that time, I was expecting Arshi, I was seven months pregnant when the lockdown happened and the sales were absolutely skyrocketing for us for the first time ever. Obviously, right now the numbers are nothing, but back then it changed the way we looked at Dot as a business itself, right? Which is why I could not take a sabbatical and let the business run on autopilot. That was not the kind of team strength we had. Which is when Suyash had to fully fledgedly get into the business, whatever was of the business. But that did not require him to switch ships completely because it was still not a very big business in its own self, which would take 100% of his time. But after he got into it, I think what he realized was much bigger than what I ever saw, which was how much potential was actually there in the business. And then, then I think is when we started yeah. speaking to investors and trying to explore more and more what was so happening in the space. The, good you brought up the investor space. So <laughs> that actually brings me to the question that, uh, you know, we've all grown up in family business where equity and shareholding in the business is the most important thing, right? Uh, taking external money is uh, taboo. In fact, uh, you know, obviously the next generation chain, but there was a time when if you had bank debt also, you're like, hey, bank, bank, and I say, huh, all of that conversation. So, uh, you know, uh, was seeking out investors more of a need-based thing that you guys wanted to do? Was it more with regards to kind of taking external, external capital to unlock the valuation in the business, right? Uh, where... You know, now somebody in the market has now said, yeah, your business is worth X amount of money. Because when you run private businesses, uh, privately held businesses, there's no way to really a certain market value, right? Unless you go public. Uh, and real estate is something that can get valued. But uh, running businesses based on cash flows, not necessarily always positive cash flows, right? Uh, mostly startups are negative cash flow businesses where you've kind of financed it. So, A, why did you think that you needed to take external capital? And when did you think the timing was right in terms of now going out and saying, yeah, you know what, we need to take external money to, for the reason that we wanted to take it for. So, which one of you would take that question? Yeah, yeah so I think, yeah. I think I'll take it up. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very important for a consumer business to know what stage of the company you're in and how's the external environment like, right? So, unlike, unlike most of the other traditional companies, uh, the growth that, that is typically expected of a company is typically high and the costs are actually, uh, in, the costs are pretty high as well. So you need to achieve the growth uh, to justify the costs in the longer term. Uh, the biggest cost being marketing um, and talent in, in, in a consumer business. So what we realized was that as, the, as you grow and as you move forward and multiple businesses come into the same business, the cost of marketing goes up and the share of voice goes down. So if they are taking funding and you don't have the money in your pocket, you're losing out. Uh, second, uh, what we also realized that in order to make a business plan for the next three years, you needed money. You need to burn money in marketing. You need to, you need a clear vision to function and explore 
before you really start pivoting as a brand. And we realized we had to get that money. So coming from a hardcore real estate background, if I would go to my dad at uh, dad, I need ten crores to burn. He'd look at look at me as as if you know, uh, you know, I'm 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 kind of uh, a burglar. Oh, <laughs> crazy! Uh, absolutely crazy. So, uh, so that whole concept wasn't uh, going down uh, very well with me to even ask him. Uh, so, when when I saw the environment, when I saw the kind of business that that needed to be built and for our vision to uh, be achieved, we thought we needed to get external funding. You know, that was the need of the business. We didn't think we wanted a strategic. We did not think we wanted a VC. We did not uh, have a thought on that. But we knew we needed external capital to structure our business better, to hire better talent, and see it as a solid business rather than just just being a hobby which is taking off pretty well. Yeah, but money is money, right? Uh, whether it comes from VC, PE, strategic, uh, at the end of the day, as far as uh, it can accelerate, you know, your your focus on taking the business in the direction that you want to take it, uh, that's most important, right? And uh, I think uh, you guys done a fantastic job with uh, a building it up. Taking it up to the level that you want, and then uh, you know, kind of hunting, finding a good strategic partner, uh, investor in this space. So that brings me to the question, which is more dated now. Now you know, everybody knows. For those who don't know, uh, Nike has strategically invested in Dot and Key, uh, and uh, as you know, Nike is currently the biggest uh, fashion brand right now in terms uh, uh, of like, cosmetic yeah, beauty yeah, right yeah, now, yeah, right? Yeah. right? And uh, would it be safe to call it like the Sephora of India, or, or yeah, 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 right? So absolutely. you know where they have their own brands, and they also kind of put out uh, other brands and absolutely. and build up both uh, online and offline marketplace, right? So they have stores uh, in malls, and then they have B two C brands of their own, and now Dot and Key happens to be one of their, uh, you know, in the brand in their stable. So now that you know you ran the business with your own. Uh, Whims, fancies. Uh, I understand, you know, and especially when you kind of were running it in the family business. And when I say in the family business, I, you know, the source of capital for the business uh, was family. So it kind of becomes a family business, even if you're yeah. trying to run it independently. Absolutely, it's still something you get called up on, but not quite as often and not in the structure, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, when we run a family business, we do whatever we want. Uh, you know, we run them however we want. And now with uh, you know. You being part of the Nike family, right? I'm sure uh, the whole structure of now having a formal board, uh, you know, being accountable for everything, getting to those uh, quarterly board meetings, uh, reporting everything, uh, uh, full disclosures, third-party auditors. Uh, there's so much at play now, right? So, is that something that you're kind of getting used to, so uh, you know, like quickly? Or is this something that you still kind of sometimes fall into? Like, oh, you know what? I I realize that I'm now playing with other people's money too. Most of the time, it was your own. Uh, specifically, you know, your accountability is whether I burn to the ground or I take it a billion dollars. It it doesn't matter because the end of the day, it's what I did. But do you think the 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 pressure or let's say the sense of responsibility now is even more than it was when you were under the family business faction? Or uh, do you think it hasn't changed? It's the same. It doesn't matter. I think. Uh... I think the biggest difference between uh, looking at your business as a family business and looking at your business as a as a subsidiary of uh, another company who's invested in your company is that they put they put in the money seeing you, right? The company is as good as the entrepreneurs uh, running the show and running the business. So now the money is on on someone who is running the horse, the jockey rather the horse itself. So in this case, it's us. So the kind of respect and trust when up is put into a person, like especially us, Anish and me. Uh, you know, we obviously feel that we need to deliver on the promises. We need to deliver on what is committed, and we need to perform. And there is always pressure uh, of performance, which is much more than before. But I think the kind of performance that we expect from your team, the kind of organization you build, is also way more powerful. And way more, uh, you know, way more ready to face the world than it ever was because the level of discipline uh, that you need to build around your lives and in your personal behavior, uh, in terms of the team you build, in terms of uh, how you approach work, is very very different. Honestly, how we were as individuals then and the kind of organization we were running then and today, 
I don't think it's the same organization. And I do Absolutely. not think that uh, that that time you were ready to take on the world. And today, like you know, proudly we can say that we are ready to take on the world uh, with the team. You know, the kind of team we have and the kind of thought process we have, the kind of clarity which uh, with which we uh, kind of approach the business is very, 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 very different from what it was. I think this is a much more streamlined uh, way of working. And I think the concept really teaches us a lot as individuals. And I think uh, that has been pretty brilliant. But of course, answering your initial question, uh, the pressure is obviously more, but then it helps you uh, perform better as well. No, but like, you know, there's obviously pressure is one side of it. The other side, flip side of it is, for example, right, you know, uh, think about this, the now that you're in the seat, uh, I'm sure you still sit on the board of uh, Dot and Key. Of course, uh, yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, but at the same time, you're in executive roles too. And now you have your your board seats and then you have external board members uh, on, on the Dot and Key board. Right? So, yes, you are in the driving seat. But at the same time, you are accountable every quarter for how you've driven for the last three months. Uh, you know, so that's something obviously to look at. You have to report numbers. You have things to look at. But how do you... Uh, kind of handle, uh, you know, let's say dissidents, right? So uh, if there's a certain uh, direction you want to take and it's something that requires board approval, for example, have you till now faced a, you know, a situation where uh, the board and you in totality have not seen eye to eye or till now it's kind of been something that's uh, kind of just been kind of rubber stamped to the point where they still kind of say, yeah, so they should you call the shots, we're just backing you on this. Or has there been an incident or an experience till now where for the first time you kind of face resistance and and you know till the time it's resistance from the family business it's okay it's like dad telling you off <laughs> right uh, you're like hearty yeah, I'll handle you over dinner but uh, that's not something uh, you'd obviously kind of face the same thing with an external board so has there been such an incident till now and how are you taking the like the first time that happened honestly we've never faced a resistance per se uh, our board is very smart people who really know the subject, at least our subject, what we're doing very well. So they act as advisors to help us build ourselves uh, to think about certain things. But the only one difference when you have to report to a board is you're accountable. So you have to reflect on how you have performed, which was something which was which you don't really do in a um, in a family setup. So that reflection of how you perform. Is something which doesn't come easy. The first couple of board meetings are fairly difficult, uh, especially performance review. But I think you just push yourself to plan more and to try and achieve numbers so that uh, you can get where you want to be. Yeah, I couldn't handle it, personally. And I was in a similar situation as yours when um, I was running a cold rolling mill and uh, I obviously did, uh, my idea of uh, a needing external capital was not uh, because I could hang up value or fuel that fire. It was literally because um, I was in financial trouble. So uh, it was, uh, you know, either run the plant, sell it, or let the kind of figure out to kind of uh, do away with it. And at that time, uh, my personal experience was to kind of save the business, you know, the strategic investment IMB came in and, you know, putting money into things. So I was in a equal board position, uh, in a CEO position for six months, but I couldn't deal with it. Uh, you know, I couldn't deal with it to the point where it was very different to have a conversation with your father. You, know, you don't see eye to eye, but all of a sudden you're sitting in a boardroom with six people and, uh, you know, every single thing needs to be passed, rubber stand, uh, things like that. And especially, you know, things like capital expenditure or working capital requirements. And uh, after a while, I was like, you know what, this is going to get to a point where I'm not going to be able to run it the way that I want to run it uh, because the I'm, I'm a loose cannon. So I kind of, you know, I know what I need to do, what I need to go for. And, and the first time it happened to me, I was sitting there going, yeah, I don't know I can deal with this. So um, I, I literally exited the position in six months. And we got an external CEO, which we hired. And, and we went through five CEOs after that for over, over four years. But yeah, so from my personal experience, I, I couldn't handle it. But it's good to know that, you know, uh, you, you're liking the fact that, and I think it's a good thing. Personally, now when I look back in retrospect, I think, uh, the structure, the more formal disciplined board structure is a good structure to go the, grow the business uh, because you are not the single person responsible uh, for not just taking it to the next level, but even if it goes down, right? And that whole check uh, and balance of a uh, quarterly discussion, a quarterly review, looking at the numbers, that this actually adds a good sense of discipline and you know keeps you on track uh, on what you want to do. 
but yeah, like the first time I got hit in like resistance board, I was like, yeah, I can't do this. I was much younger then. I I, I was uh, you know I was like just about on thirty. I still had that whole thing. Now I'm almost thirty six, but yeah, I think uh, I should have handled it better then. But uh, personal experience, I couldn't handle it. But I, I'm good. Glad to know that you guys are kind of you know fit, fitting into it and dealing with it. Uh, uh, I I feel our board is not just about you know the numbers and performance. Obviously, that is a very large part of everything. But I think we found mentors who we didn't have before in this business. You know, like. Even at Joy, even if even if it's the same business, same background, right? It, it's still beauty. The business is like different at Nike because they've been in the space and they understand the space. They're leaders in the space, sure. rather. We found mentors in them, so I think it couldn't have gotten better than this. Yeah. I think the strategic partnership that we have, it's a both way. No, it's fantastic, right? and, and that's that's what I'm saying. That's right? something that, that is absolutely beautiful. Like, yeah, yeah, and for us, it was not always about uh, it was not more about unlocking value in terms of. Uh, exiting part of the stake, it was more about uh, giving to the business what it required to yeah. grow. I, 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 no, but it's good to know. See, at the end of the day, uh, uh, what 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 I really like about the structure of you know your deal per se is that you got to unlock value, you got to get money into the business, so you got a bit of both, right? Where you could able to kind of also kind of uh, protect yourself and your hard work and your investment that you put in over the years, at the same time being able to fuel that fire. Uh, a lot of startups nowadays get funded only on. Primary rounds, right? So, which means the money comes in only as fresh okay. equity. You always, you always have a certain percentage which you can take as second deal, even there. Yeah, but a lot, a lot yeah. of that generally, see, in terms of first-time investment, uh, because yours has been more like a Series A, yeah. right? Uh, so, in your Series A, generally, standard practice does not involve, uh, uh, you know, uh, promoters uh, of the company or the founder of the company being able to exit even a certain percentage because they're not there to encash that. The idea is that you build this up, the valuation will grow. Let's talk on Series B, Series C, where yeah. uh, you know we'll buy your stake out for X. But on the next investor will come in, we'll have to kind of buy you out. But uh, in a way, it's good. It's good that you know uh, Nike has seen that kind of uh, let's say value. Value is the real word here, right? In in the brand you guys have built, uh, in in uh, the recognition, the brand, the product, because it's all of that together, right? It's not just the brand that you built. It's the product you guys have worked on. And especially in such a short duration, right? When I think in four years, you guys uh, yeah. have moved from like seeding it to taking it up to a certain level, going through COVID, uh, you know, uh, in three and a half, yeah. three and a half years, then finding that strategic investment and then kind of being in this position. So I think that's commendable. And uh, there's so much that we all need to learn from uh, you guys in terms of, you know, having that thing. And uh, in, uh, you know, one more question that I have, you guys, is you guys are couple entrepreneurs, right? Uh, you mm-hmm. kind of... Uh, <laughs> so <a> topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, no, normal couples can't even see eye to eye and what we want to eat for dinner, <laughs> right? So, you know, there's always that thing of, uh, I want to eat Italian and I want to go eat Chinese food and that kind of deal. So, how does that work? So, uh, you know, like, you know, let's not talk about board resistance. Uh, let's not talk about resistance. Let's talk about the real resistance, right? So what happens when you guys don't like kind of see eye to eye on something? How does that work? Yeah, we fight it out. Yeah, I think, I think we, 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 we logic it out, I think. Like, but do you guys like take it home? Or, of course. Okay. Of course. It's personal. <laughs> so, okay. so, yeah. Absolutely. We yeah. home, fight over it at dinner and breakfast and dinner the next day. Uh, so it's just, yeah. Well, that, that's pretty but, good. Uh, yeah, I think it was like That's that. not good. It's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. No, but I'm, see, at the end of the day, I think uh, at the end of the day, when you both realize that you are actually kind of uh, rooting for the same team, uh, you know, yeah. it, it's in both your best interest that, uh, you know, Don is successful and you guys want to like, you know, that's the end game, right? Yeah. If you're fighting, you, the fight is not about personal interest. Of course. Uh, the fight is for the business. And till the time that fight exists, it's, it's a healthy fight. Yeah. Obviously, it can get bad sometimes, I'm sure, right? And could have been like three days we haven't spoken because we didn't agree on it. No, that's not an option. Yeah. No, we no, you can't do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 then you keep it strictly professional, right? Then, then, no, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so there's so, a problem at a personal front because of which we don't want to talk to each other. We still can't do that because work requires you to talk and work next day. So, and office, we're still talking to each other. So, working so, together has uh, kind of added to your marriage in terms of uh, making it stronger. Because uh, you kind of learn to disagree, agree, and still move on with it, 
and not being able to handle the grudge. Yeah, I think so. I right? never saw it that way. But yeah, yeah, that's true. Right? Because that's you guys true. face that conflict. Yeah. But you realize that you can't do it. You have to go to the morning office with someone. Yeah, you have to go back with someone. So, with that situation, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you, you don't have that, uh, let's say, luxury of, uh, you know, kind of saying, I don't want to talk to you right now. That doesn't happen. So, yeah. that in a way actually strengthens the relationship, right? Because you easily move past and and uh, you know get on with it mm-hmm. so that's possibly a good way to look at things yeah <laughs> that's that's pretty cool yeah. so what's next for dot and key i think what's next for dot and key is a interesting question uh, i think dot and key is still the mother brand it's still uh, where the majority of our business comes from uh, the plan is to take it offline be available across india okay. and and be uh, change the entire game from a d2c to a hardcore to new business that is the entire vision and thought process for dot in the next few years that's fantastic guys uh more power to you uh, you guys are actually the remarkable phenomenal story and i'm sure people who watch this video and hear the podcast will kind of you know uh, learn from it because there's so many aspects and that's what we want to build with this right we want uh, people to understand that uh, you know you really do not have to be stuck in that family business cycle Uh, there's so much you can use from that to leverage it to take it up to new level and yeah. you know being part of that old business is not the end of your career uh, it's actually you know the beginning of it and uh, if you want there's so much that you can kind of take away and learn from it so yeah thanks guys this is thank you for being a fabulous host <laughs>